do you start with a uh, a character or an actor or a theme or just a, a feeling? No, actually, I honestly I start with uh, Jean Luc Nancy book. I was reading. I was shooting actually. It was during the shooting of Trouble Every Day, and uh, normally when I'm shooting, I cannot read books because. Uh, but I had that book. I, I wanted to read it. It's very short. It's thirty page. I knew what it was about actually. Uh, but the experience of reading was so physical to me with no joke so penetrating that I felt almost physically the heart transplant, the rejection of um, the immunity system. It was like a battle, you know? And I think for the first time I realized I, I was aware that the heart was um, set in the cage of the rib, of the ribs, which of course everyone know, but to feel it, it's, it's a very strange experience. And I thought maybe it was a sort of hysterical thing because I was shooting and, and I was extremely tired or whatever. But then the, the those pages kept sort of working themselves in in my mind, you know. So as soon as I finished trouble every day, I was and I didn't know how, what to do. I didn't know because I thought maybe this is not fiction, and yet it was already fiction to me, yeah. you know. So, strangely enough, um, Jean-Luc wrote a book about Beau Travail, uh, wrote a, a text also about Beau Travail. Oh. And we were introduced to each other. And I told him, I've read L'Intrus, and would you allow me to do something with the book. He says, do you want to do a documentary about me? And I said, no, I, I think it's going to be fiction. And I think it, he, he was not aware of the process because I did a short film with him in part of the... 10 minutes later. Mm, older. Yeah, older, yeah. Older, yeah. Um, in, in which he speaks about intrusion as a teacher of philosophy with one of his students. So he thought it would not be possible that the film I was telling him about would be so different. Uh, fiction documentary was not sure, but he... And then I really plunged into the project and decide to separate my, not to have no relation with Jean-Luc, but I didn't want to bother him with uh, this sort of trip, you know, mm -hmm. I made with his book. And, and uh, I want him to show him, to invite him to in the editing room uh, two years after, you know, so. And he was very surprised and, well, now it's been a year since the film is finished, so now the film, he speaks about the film as if it was his. He, he says um, he is the intruder of the, of the film, you know. But he was surprised and, and therefore I realized that I've been, um, that the, the book really worked on me in a very strong way because I thought I was, and I think still, that I did translate exactly the book 
and I invent nothing that was not in the book. And I think now it's funny because now Jean-Luc admitted, you know, but at the beginning he says, well, have you been, um, are you sure this was in the book? And uh, pff, what have you been, you know? And now, I, I, yeah, I was sure. And I think now it's, um, he's, he's convinced too, you know? It's, it's very strange because it was not an adaptation, even more than unconventional. It, it, it was really um, like smoking a joint in a way. It was like starting from a point and not knowing what was happening to me because it was a very physical reaction. I, I have been feeling something in my chest Actually, it's my heart, but I never felt my heart before, you know? Yeah. Maybe it's also why I decided that the main character would be a so-called heartless man, or yeah. a, a man with no heart, yeah. Yeah. you know? Uh, tell us about Michel Subo. What fascinates you about him? And how is he, how do you direct him? Does he require a lot of information uh, it, it's very when I did uh, approach Michel and found out where Michel was hiding for beau travail um, he liked the suit immediately to be the commandant of the legion he understood completely what I thought about petit soldat and him being there hiding in the foreign legion so he, he liked it very much and he took the as I said the uniform and that was it. He shaved his head and no, he, he, he was ready for, for it, you know. Yeah. All right. Now, l'intrus, in a way for me, was a sort of homage to Michel Subor. But I couldn't say that to Michel, as I could not say that to Jean-Luc, because Jean-Luc was, in a way, not jealous, but he could not imagine who could be that man but him, yeah, yeah. you know? So when I, intru I, I introduced Jean-Luc to Michel, and Jean-Luc did a great thing, he, he opened his shirt and showed him his scar, you know? It was a very striking moment, and Michel, walk him to the station and he was terribly moved and it was his first real approach to the film Jean-Luc Scar because he had read the script already yeah. and he was telling me yes about this about that. <laughs> but the minute he saw Jean-Luc who had this new heart and saw his car Michel completely re-understood the script he Instead of um, trying to manipulate the script, as Michel would always try <laughs> to bring it yeah. to him, he was like um, afraid a little bit, and and he started feeling pain. That's true. Yeah. I had to call a doctor once, you know. He he, he suddenly left himself drift in the film. It was a very dramatically change, you know? Yeah, yeah. Suddenly was like taken by the film instead of being taken, yeah. you know? The, the, and it was, of course, not difficult to direct because I would say Consciously and unconsciously, the film was tailored for him, you know? So sometimes Michel would say, you know, by the way, I don't understand why he's doing this. And I say, oh, Michel, I told you many times because of this. <laughs> uh -huh, yeah. But it was his way to tell me, don't take for granted, um, I'm going to be a toy in your hand, you know. I will resist till the, till the last scene. But on the set, 
There was no direction at all. Michel was, um, was très beau, but the strange thing is, um, Michel pretends now <laughs> that Louis Trebor changed him. And I keep telling him that he was already like that, you know, but he didn't want to look at it clearly. But uh, everything, every detail of this man comes from him, you know. If you look at Petit Soldat, I think if I got so much this, this desire to work with Michel, it's because, and I don't, I don't want to be rude to actors, but I think Michel was never an actor. Michel is the young man in Le Petit Soldat, as he is Louis Trevor in my film, because. Michel as a way of non-acting presence that was almost shocking for me when I saw Petit Soldat. And not only me, because many act, um, directors never want to work with Michel after Petit Soldat because they thought he was a right-wing uh, terrorist again, you know. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's yeah. Michel as is absorbing, you know? Some people, when they act because they want to reflect something, Michel is like a black hole in the cosmos, is absorbing all the energy, and, and you feel it, you know? It's, it's, it's for me, it is a very, um, I don't know if I will ever work again with Michel because of course, it, it, it is, it's a question of having a story that yeah. fits him, but yeah. Michel is, he, I don't know, I think probably why sometimes he had terrible fight with other directors is because he hated the act, the idea that acting was to do a lot, you know? M Michel, I guess, understood, he's a very em emotional person, but because he's strong, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? Physic physicality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Was this your most difficult shoot with, in terms of oh, yeah. logistics, um, you know, moving from Mountains, oh yeah, sea, completely. Filming in boats. Completely difficult. Also because it was made with a budget for TV, uh, yeah. like Beau Travail, produced yeah, yeah. by Arte. Yeah. So of course we were much under budget. The crew, we were a very small crew. I had made many sacrifices on the number of technicians, many sacrifices, but in a in a. I was happy to do that, you know, because I, I thought it was a great opportunity Arte, Arte offered me that after Beau Travail, so I, I, of course, I immediately say yes, knowing that it was going to be difficult. But then my producer also was absolutely the most um, perfect producer for that film. but. He was also uh, suffering from a very severe depression and um, he, he, he killed himself um, before we finished. So it was really an, a, a very lonesome, very long process and sometimes very lonesome, yeah. yeah. Mm. But within that you have your regular creative collaborators. It's a small team yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and your regular actors. Oh, of course. You? I was not suffering from the lack of... No, I, I had exactly what I wanted. I had been doing location scouting uh, in France. It's uh, a part where my one of my... a member of my family come from, so it's a place I know very well and 
especially this house. Um, every every grass of that place I knew as a child. This forest was my night nightmare as a child. I was afraid in it. Yeah. Um, I was afraid to be killed by hunters, or I was afraid to be lost, you know. Um, I've been crossing the border to Switzerland um, because my aunt was working in a watch factory in Switzerland, and she would um, smuggle watch, watches to France, you know. So a lot of things I knew there, you know. And South Korea, I... I knew very well too, really? thanks to the Busan Film Festival. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and uh, South Pacific. I've been with my collaborator, the co-writer of the film. We've been traveling there, and we spend a lot of time there to. I, I really wanted to not to be hypnotized by the beauty of those islands. I wanted to be like someone who had already experienced it and who knew at first sight that beneath the beauty and the charm, I mean, the extreme beauty and the gentleness of the people there, there was something li little, li little. Uh, Lethal, yeah, Lethal. Yeah, yeah. Beneath, it's almost beneath. The yes, surface, yeah. and it's something I, of course, understood by reading Gauguin's diary yeah. and by reading uh, Stevenson short stories yeah. from South Pacific. Yeah, yeah I was uh, aware, but I wanted to experience it, you know, because I knew the attraction of a beautiful landscape is something dangerous for a film, you know. You you must know exactly what you want to express yeah. Yeah. with the landscape. Because if 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 then camera is uh, like um suppose is like uh, hypnotized by, you know, then it's dangerous. Yeah. So I really wanted to be um sure uh, that I knew how to do it. So it's it's not ugly, it's still, it has its, its beauty, yeah. but you could feel the danger for him. Yeah. And I remember when we start shooting, the crew said, ah, oh, Jura, Jura is the name of this part of France. Yeah. Jura, pfft. oh, we wish we could be already in Tahiti. I said, you will see at the end, you will regret Jura as a place reasonably good for us, you know? Yeah. And I remember when we were back from Tahiti, getting ready to go back to Jura, Jura to film the snow scene. Yeah. Everyone was very happy, you know? What I like uh, thinking of the South Sea Islands, the tempo in the film drops in the final 30 minutes. Yeah. Like Louis's failing heart. Yeah, yeah. And there's a sort of... Almost no more dream and, yeah. And he's just petering out. Yeah. And that's so the landscape is in a mm. different... Yeah. With a different tempo. Yeah, yeah. I saw this black island in the dusk. For me, it was like... Um, a tomb with a purple veil or something, you know, for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I really saw it like that, you know, when I was doing location scouting. I was amazed. Probably it's the only place in the world where, where I experience dusk, sunsets that way. And I don't know if because of the South Hemisphere. Yeah. For me, Let's say, naturally, I prefer dawn to sunset. It, this is my chemical reaction to day and night. But there, I remember when I was location scouting, at dusk time, I remember we were on that cargo boat 
going to the Marquesian island. I thought I was going at dusk. I was this purple light, really purple, you know. Ah, I felt I was going to die. And then I, I remember this purple color in Gauguin's painting. I always thought it was sort of artificial thing coming from fauve experience. Yeah. Yeah. But I really, <laughs> I experienced, experienced it. it yeah. Even on, on photograph, on still photograph, you know. Mm. Can I ask about your how you tell stories? Um, there are a lot of meander, and there was especially for this film a lot of meanders in the approach, because of the book by Jean Luc Nancy. Yeah. Therefore, it was a constant, uh, like ping pong reaction between the book and my understanding, you know, yeah. my reaction yeah. and also my emotion. So I was trying to believe that the film was in between yeah. my emotion and the book. And then because we were writing for Michel, then I realized the simplest way for me was to try to be like inside him, as if he was afraid and yet willing to have this new chance, this new heart, and yet afraid to be involved in any love relation, and yet dreaming of a perfect relation between father and son. You know, yeah, yeah. completely abstract, as he was running away from his son and his grandchildren, as the guy who he is when he's buying the watch. He is buying the new heart like he's buying the watch. Yeah. You know? It's a transaction. And, and there was a point when I imagined there could be a scene in a sort of in an hospital, in a surgery room, and we could film a heart transplant, which immediately I thought, no, I was not going to do that because then I thought it would be non-fiction at that moment. It would be really a chest of someone and the heart of, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I thought it was unfair to the film to use, even if I was doing, filming it myself, to, to use somebody else chest and heart and then that's how i imagine buying the watch could could be 50 percent of the heart transplant and let's say the resurrection would be in in the end of the korean massage woman yeah. as right. if the, it, it was the second person left, you know. So from that sort of interpretation of heart transplant, it's to give you an example that everything in a way was very simple. Yeah. It came as very simple metaphor, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe the assembling, which is sort of for me very straight because it's geographically is yeah. is um, is um, tracks but of course it's um the assembling is is erratic as uh, as he is probably but i was not trying to break the narration or you know no i I was trying to follow it as as thoroughly as I could. And even when we were editing the film, the editor thought we were going to change the order. And, and, and actually, I would say, no, um, it hasn't changed, except the end sequence with Beatrice on the sleigh, yeah. 
yeah. was not was written uh, to be the exact uh, medium of the film, the center of the film. Oh, so it would split. Oh, Leaving the the, the North Hemisphere. And heading to the south. Yeah. Yeah, but then I decided because. Strange thing happened. First day of shooting in Pusan, who was supposed to be already spring, it starts snowing. Yeah. It was not expected at all. They had not seen snowflakes for 15 years. So I was filming, of course, I said, we have to film those flakes. I don't know why, but we have to. It was not expected. And in the editing room, then, Winter was postponed to South Korea, so then to add Beatrice and the sleigh after Michel Louis Trebor has, let's say, resurrected from the end of the massage yeah. was for me fake. So then I remember that I always thought in myself that the film should express that the world was round. So I then decided to put it at the end because while he is in the south, lying on his boat, it's winter in in Jura and you know, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's all how I solved that little problem with uh, snowing in Pusan. Such a strange thing. Yeah. Uh, t tell me about um, uh, uh, you know. It's uh, I, I say it's funny because. Shooting on location is a strange thing because, of course, because it's dangerous. Locations are always dangerous because you are um, in the end of weather condition and a lot of other things. But it creates sometimes an, another destiny to a scene, you know? Oh, completely. Mm -hmm. And to performances, and I imagine, for the, for the actors to be... While we were shooting Beatrice on the sleigh, she had that beautiful smile. And I, I tell her, too bad it's not the end of the film. That smile touched my heart, you know? Yeah. And I said, it's too bad it's going to be in a sad part of the film, you know? It, it, and it... I was going to ask about... Katia got a bit. Yeah. Because I think um, British audiences may have just seen her in tw uh, 29 Parts. Yeah. Um, and she's in this film titled merely as Russian in the credits, no name. She's like the angel of death. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, I didn't want to put that in the yeah. credit because Katia is very... Um, afraid of, um, she's very religious, so I thought if I call her Angela, yeah. I never told her. I said, you're the destiny of the film. Yeah. I never told her you're the angel of death, you know, because I, 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 um, I was afraid, you know. But, but like many of the, of the characters, she seems to be almost a, a, a figment of his, ima you know, uh, yeah. an imagined, <laughs> Well, I think uh, because for me it was such a masculine film from father to son, son to father, and it was an absolute masculine mm. film. And for a strange reason, because at the very beginning I fight against that idea and I decide why do I have to take a man and it could be a woman, but then I realize there was two problems for me, like, apart the fact that I wanted Michelle, but a woman's chest means not only a cage of rib, yeah. it means also the breast, yeah. and it changed the, the message of the scar, you know? Because if you look at the chest of a woman, even though if you see the scar, it's so close to the breast that it, yeah. it, it's no more the heart, all right? Yeah. That was number one. Number two, by chance, a friend of mine with a doctor with a 
a specialist in transplant, liver transplant, told me normally women have not very good re um, reaction. Yeah, they reject. They reject more. Yeah. They have a more stronger immune system and it doesn't work so well on women yeah. because of their the immune system is very strong um, because they can because for pregnancy to, to protect the baby yeah, yeah. and therefore the yeah so it became for me strictly masculine yeah. and all the women character became I would say like his crown of distant uh, planets you know yeah. like bamboo yeah um, Beatrice the Beatrice. little girl from this forest yeah the wild yeah, yeah, yeah. wild girl with a dog uh, his, his son wife Florence, yeah. of course the, the Beatrice and and um, then of course very important the yeah. la, the masses with almost a magician in the film for me she's um, making him alive you know yeah, yeah. with her hands yeah and and then what is left of his past in South Pacific is not important this why this ex-wife yeah. is no more in relation with him so the only woman he will see important for him are the nurse in the hospital. Yeah, yeah. How did you um, collaborate with um, Stuart Staples for this film? Do you, do, does he have an idea in advance? What Do you tell him a bit about the film and then he goes away? Oh, I uh, always translate, have the, straight, the, the script translate for him. Yeah. So he could read the script before we go shooting. So if he feels something in the script already. Also, sometimes he doesn't like something. I, I like his advice. Um, and I told him before we start shooting that I had given Michelle an image to work on, and this image was Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash was still alive, yeah, yeah. and I gave him a, a pile of songs by Johnny Cash and some picture of Johnny Cash to Michelle and I told him listen to that it's 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 good for Trebor you know yeah. there is even the little scene when he's Strumming. yeah so I told Stuart if you agree with that and Stuart more than agree I would like guitar huh? and he, he was a he agreed on that but when he saw the image of the dailies. We had already shot uh, half of the film. We were halfway to shooting before Korea. He looked at the image and he said, it's strange. I think if I create too much of a melody, uh, we are going to lose this, in, um, this inside trip of trouble. And, and Stuart says, I feel like I should be the drill of the film. Yeah. I said, what do you mean the drill? <laughs> he said, I think I'm going to do a loop. I was completely surprised because for me, I would never expect Stuart to react like that, you know? He is a drilling guy, I must say. It's yeah. not, this was not surprising for me. Yeah. But in the meantime, also, Johnny Cash had died yeah. and I understood that very well no melody you know that that I really agree and I said okay let's I bet on that and even though a loop is is uh, is rather hard in the editing room because it's uh, editing a loop you have to trust a loop Editing a melody, it's easier, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In editing a loop, you have to trust that the rhythm of the film is fine. For me, to work with Stuart and to 
and not to trust him would be to choose Michel and, and regret another actor that would be more convenient, you know? He, strong personalities are a great um, chance because I think the way they give, they give a sense of danger they're not putting the project in danger. On the contrary, they they bring more because also they are in danger. But it brings a sense that um, the music is part of the film. It's not an element you bring at the end to make it smooth, you know? It's really something that is inside. Yeah.